General Eisenhower's understanding of what the G.I. went through was thorough and sound, an understanding confirmed by the G.I.s themselves. Yeah, the general really hit it on the nose. They can talk all they want about the more glamorous branches of the service winning the war. The guy who got the dirty end of the deal, in Italy especially, was a plain G.I. Right, Louis? Check. You know, before we went into Italy, I thought the Nazis were our only enemy. But the weather was just as tough. And after a while, it was the routine and the same old rations and no chance to sleep that started to get me. I thought I'd never get back to the States. Never have a meal again that didn't come out of a ration can. It was perfectly good food, of course. But after a while, it began to taste pretty terrible. Especially during those months of cold, damp weather when a good meal would have done wonders. The weather turned from bad to worse, and from worse to lousy. It depressed everybody, including the general. American soldiers frequently referred, in terms of sarcastic disgust, to sunny Italy. Heavy rains fell and the streams were habitually torrents. Men and vehicles sank in the mud. The war itself was pretty rugged. All the guys I know who were in three or four campaigns pick Italy as the toughest one of the bunch. The enemy wasn't kidding. Every mile we advanced in Italy was one after a stiff fight. And we took quite a beating doing it. It began to look as though the Germans didn't particularly want us in Italy. The terrain was terrible. That kind of country was much tougher on the guys who were advancing. That was us. You know, the guys who sat in the mountains and took pot shots at us. We'd capture one mountain, and there'd be another one right in front of us. I used to dream about Nebraska and that nice flat land. But the dream never lasted long. They really let us have it. when those rocks came in handy. Somehow you never had the feeling that you were down deep enough. After a while, you got so mad that you were actually glad when the moment came to move up and start pouring it on the enemy. We used everything we had. Rifles, BARs, and mortars. stalemates, there always exists the problem of maintaining morale among fighting men while they are suffering losses. Among green troops, the problem is much more serious than among veterans. The attitude of the latter was well expressed in a remark made to me one day by a sergeant. Generally said, on the map, this job looked easy, but now the Heinies seem to have something to say about it. There is nothing wrong with us that a good rousing victory won't cure. There is an old expression, the nakedness of the battlefield. It is descriptive and full of meaning for anyone who has seen a battle. The feeling that pervades the forward areas is loneliness. There is little to be seen. Friend and foe, as well as the engines of war, seem to disappear from sight when troops are deployed for a fight. Loss of control and cohesion are easy, 
Because each man feels himself so much alone, and each is prey to the human fear and terror that to move or show himself may result in instant death. Here is where confidence in leaders, a battle, a most formidable soldier. beat on you too accurately. Then down into another hole. Sometimes you couldn't get rid of the feeling that this time might be your last. But after the enemy pulled out, there you were, still alive. It was quite a kick, moving up to take over the territory we fought for so hard. Each town we moved into seemed a little closer to Berlin and the end of the war. We didn't fight all the time, although it usually seemed that way to us. The effect of prolonged combat is always bad. If a unit is brought out of line before the processes of physical and mental fatigue have gone too far, it can be ready for re-entry into battle far sooner than one that has been kept in line too long. Moreover, the periodic rests for the frontline soldier have a splendid effect upon morale. And in any kind of warfare, troop morale is always a decisive factor. An immediate visit along the entire battlefront convinced me again of the soundness of our view that winter operations in Italy would be accompanied by the utmost hardship and difficulty. I felt that maintenance of morale would require careful control of operations and the best efforts of all commanders. Certainly, I intended to be close by to help. My visits to the front were, in addition, the occasion for serious discussion of problems involving particularly replacements, ammunition, clothing and equipment for winter weather, and future plans. Nothing can take the place of direct contact between commanders. We weren't pulled out of the lines very often, but when we were, we made the most of it. It was quite a luxury to be really clean again, and it was relaxing, just shooting the breeze and knowing that a shell wouldn't be landing on top of you any second. After we took Naples, the first beer was issued since the Italian campaign began. It was brewed right in Naples itself by an American officer who remembered the formula from back in the States. To the GIs who were lucky enough to be on the spot when the first issue was distributed, the beer tasted a thousand times better than it ever did in Chicago or Savannah. But for every lucky soldier who got beer in Italy, there were a lot more who didn't know there was any beer to be had in the whole country. When somebody in the area had a radio, we tune in Command Performance, a program from the state that answered GI's request. We feel we could win the war single-handed if we could only hear Carol Landis sigh. Okay, fellas, don't forget your promise. Carol Landis will now sigh. The guys who'd looked at tourist folders about sunny Italy back in the States before the war never expected to find themselves up to their ears in snow. It was hard enough moving our heavy weapons around in that terrain, but the snow made fighting a war almost impossible. Farther back, Conditions were just as bad. The roads were treacherous. Transportation was slowed down to a walk. The men were pretty well toughened up, but living in the ground in that area for any length of time meant a sure trip to the medics. Besides pneumonia, there were skin diseases to worry about. Frostbite and trench foot were common. The commander started worrying about our combat strength being cut down. Because of the miserable conditions along the front, we began to suffer a high percentage of non-battle casualties. Trench foot was one of the principal causes. Cure is difficult, sometimes almost impossible. 
If it was a bad case, it was pretty painful. And even with regular treatment, it was tough to get rid of. While you had trench foot, you weren't much of an asset to your outfit as a fighting man. A large number of non-battle casualties could tie up a unit just as much as if they'd been shot to ribbons by the Germans. All through the Italian campaign, we hit areas that were heavily mined. To explode them, we used all the latest gadgets. A mine flail attached to a tank was pretty good at routing them out on flat country. That way, there wasn't a chance of anybody getting hurt. But we couldn't use this trick invention everywhere. In most places, the first part of the job, locating the mines, was done by our old reliable mine detectors. The next step was the really ticklish one. Getting the mine out of its hole and making it harmless took a lot of patience and a steady hand. But it saved many GI's lives. One of the trickiest of the enemy's traps was the German shoe mine. The case was all wood, and the detonator was plastic, so it didn't register on our mine detectors, which reacted only to metal. To feel out the enemy's positions, to learn where he was weak and where strong, we went on a great many patrols. For the soldier who wanted a chance to see the enemy face to face, this was the ideal group for him to be with. Even though nothing was moving besides the men in the patrol, you could usually sense it when you were in doubtful territory. From then on, all that training you had in basic came in very handy. All those hours spent on creeping and crawling and generally making yourself a poor target were paying off. building was always a possible nest of snipers. Usually it was a good idea, if possible, to approach a building from two sides at once. A few grenades sometimes did the trick, but you could never be sure. Each new patch of ground and each new building might present a tougher problem. You could never be too alert. Every now and then, one of the men got it. It might look as though the Nazis had pulled out, but you could never count on it. But the enemy machines we destroyed by shell fire were good signposts 
along the route of the Nazis' withdrawal. It grew pretty clear that the enemy was gone. Usually you could expect them to leave behind some souvenirs, always with a good, strong charge attached. No matter how fast they pulled out, the Nazis seemed to find time to booby-trap the place from top to bottom. But they weren't fooling us very much anymore as we moved on up the Italian peninsula. We got a lot of dope on the Nazis from the natives of the towns we moved in on. Most of them were glad to tell us everything they knew about the Germans. Sometimes their tips were pretty valuable. Most of our information on what the enemy was up to, what his plans were, came from the Nazis themselves the ones we'd captured. The success of our patrols depended not so much on the number of Nazis we killed, but on capturing some alive and bringing them back to our forward command post. We didn't bother to try to get any information out of them ourselves. Our job was simply to get them back without letting them out from under our rifles, without giving them a chance to pull any funny stuff. Back at the CP, they were questioned separately. First, they said no to everything. But after a while, the intelligence officer got some of them loosened up to the point where they'd talk. Every now and then, we'd get some information that would really help us in planning attacks against exposed points in the German positions. Any significant stuff, we'd relay back to division headquarters, to our rear. Just to be on the safe side, we'd include some of the prisoners' statements which didn't make sense to us but might to the men at division. They had the overall picture. All this information, true and phony, which we learned from the prisoners, got a high priority at division. In nothing flat, it would get a good going over by intelligence officers and checked with other late dope they had on the enemy. This would all be worked into a revised map of the enemy's strength in our area. It would mean a lot to the brass when they decided where to hit the Nazis next. Then, not much later, we'd be moving up again, ready to plaster the enemy some more and push him back farther and farther, till he finally had enough. Shortly before Christmas, 1943, General Eisenhower made a tour of the front lines in Italy. Our advance against the enemy was proceeding slowly, and in many places was bogged down owing to the weather. One of the chief reasons for the General's tour of inspection at this particular time was to try to give a lift to the morale of the men at the front. In addition to coping with the bitterly resisting Nazis, the G.I.s faced the overwhelming problem of functioning in a quagmire of mud. The Italian campaign was ranked with the toughest waged in the war. The terrain was treacherous. The physical problem of moving forces of men and quantities of equipment in the rugged country was an enormous one. Waging a war in such country required inexhaustible energy. In the mountainous areas, where most of the heavy fighting was centered, the G.I.s had to make their way painstakingly up to the summits, staggering under the weight of shells they would shortly fire at the enemy. Carefully planned minor offensives comprised the campaign I used during the winter, amidst the inescapably miserable conditions of the Italian mountains. 
Yankee ingenuity and resourcefulness were tested to the limit. The terrain was cut up by rivers, large and small, which ran athwart the route of advance. Some of these were so winding that they had to be crossed several times. The Valturno, which the Allies first crossed in October, was such a river, winding back and forth across the path of their advance. Now swollen by the heavy rains, it became a continuing problem to Allied forces. Since the supply route to the front up ahead must be kept open at all costs, it was imperative that a thoroughfare across the rivers be maintained in usable condition. In December 1943, this assignment was an extremely difficult one. The pontoon bridge, capable of being constructed quickly, was used to great advantage many times during the early years of the war. But occasionally, in critical conditions, it proved not durable enough. In Italy, as in all theaters of the war, casualties were not always the result of direct enemy action. To work out final plans for... The matter for discussion was a proposed amphibious operation against Anzio to be launched in January. The invasion was mounted at the port of Naples which had been virtually demolished by the retreating Nazis only three months before. Preloaded supply trucks were used for the first time in the Mediterranean theater. The invasion fleet of small ships was to head north up the coast for 120 miles and put into shore quietly at Anzio. The Allies hoped to capture the small port there before the Nazis had the opportunity to demolish it. Its seizure intact would lighten considerably the problem of supply over beaches exposed to enemy fire. The plan called for a quick strike of the enemy's flank, with fast-moving motorized units playing an essential role. Selected to make the important landing at Anzio was the American Sixth Corps, composed of allied troops who had seen months of action in North Africa, Sicily, and in the Italian campaign to date. Their mission was to seize the port of Anzio, clear out the coastal defense batteries, and proceed inland to engage the enemy, to divert him from his defense of the main front to the south. The invasion fleet put out to sea the day before D-Day, which was set for January 22nd, 1944. Surprise was to be the keynote of the assault. It worked perfectly. Without the customary pre-invasion bombardment, 6th Corps troops swarmed ashore. The enemy was caught completely off guard. So far, the operation was an easy success. Military strategy may bear some similarity to the chessboard, but it is dangerous to carry the analogy too far. A threatened king in chess must be protected. In war, he may instead choose to fight. The Nazis had not instantly withdrawn from Africa or Sicily merely because of threats to their rear. On the contrary, they had reinforced and fought the battle out to the end. In this case, of course, one of the principal objects was to induce the enemy to reinforce his Italian armies. But it was equally important that this be done in such a way that our own costs be minimized. Nazis did not overlook the Anzio landing force for long. Before the evening of the first day, the Germans reacted swiftly to meet the emergency. New divisions were rushed into Italy from other fronts, and fresh forces were thrown into the battle to stem the advance of the Allied Anzio force. By the morning of the second day, the Germans opened fire in a desperate attempt to wipe out the Allied beachhead. <laughs> <laughs> 
target area for the savage German attack, Anzio was badly battered in a few days' time. The Allies quickly consolidated their position and prepared to defend their limited beachhead area stubbornly against any Nazi counterattack, however strong. Every protective measure possible was taken to help assure our effective defense of that position. The first German assaults had been withstood successfully, but the Allied troops were fully aware that the Nazis were far from finished with them. In the final outcome, the Anzio operation paid off handsomely, but in its initial stages, it developed exactly as my headquarters thought it would. Before real results were achieved, the Anzio force had to be built up to more than six divisions and had to fight under adverse conditions for some four months. On the other hand, the move undoubtedly convinced Hitler that we intended to push the Italian campaign as a major operation. This was a great advantage to the Allies elsewhere. As a further precautionary measure, mines were planted liberally to harass the Nazis in the event that they succeeded in overrunning our lines. It was by now fairly evident that the enemy was massing for an attack in great force. The Allied Anzio force was fortunate in gaining a little time in which to make thorough preparations for meeting the attack. To counter the expected Nazi assault on their beachhead, the Allies prepared for immediate use every type of heavy artillery piece which they had succeeded in bringing ashore before being pinned down by the Nazi shelling. It was probable that the enemy did not know how much firepower we had concentrated in our beachhead area. And Allied commanders ordered that every possible device be used to prevent them from finding out ahead of time. The Allies used the time to good advantage. After two weeks of relative quiet, the enemy commenced their major counterattacks. Nazi heavy assault was directed by Field Marshal Kesselring, who commanded Axis forces in Italy. The Germans were finally ready to launch their drive to force the 6th Corps troops back into the sea. For four weeks, the Nazis gave it everything they had. The Allies suffered considerable losses in equipment as well as in men. The destruction of quantities of material made it that much more difficult for the Allies to defend their hard-won foothold. One of the most effective protective measures was quickly taken. A smoke screen composed of a hundred gallons of oil to every eight gallons of water compressed into a milky fog was spread across the Allied beachhead, covering an area of many miles along the coast. But with all our best protective measures, we still suffered heavily under the full weight of the determined Nazi attack. Allied casualties were heavy during the 30-day German assault. Hundreds of GIs killed. This advantage of a limited position from which to operate was supplemented by the Allied need for more men and materiel. But the Sixth Corps attack could not be held up to wait for any possible attempt to bring reinforcements in by sea. The attack was organized with all possible speed. Every weapon we had was pressed into service as the assault got started. We hit him with everything. Railway mounted naval guns. 90 millimeter anti-aircraft. Packed howitzers. 
75s from Sherman tanks. Self-propelled 105s on tank chassis. 155. And the eight inches. After the softening up, our tanks went into action. The back of the enemy's resistance was broken, and the men with the rifles moved forward to press the attack. The Nazis were pushed back. But our bombers continued to harass their retreat. The battle-weary GIs finally had an opportunity to enjoy a few moments' respite after the exhausting hours of continuous heavy action. Our attack was once again on the move. And from this point on, the Axis in Italy was fighting a delaying war. During the violent battle at Anzio, the Nazis suffered countless casualties and thousands of cracked German troops from such elite units as the Hermann Goering Division were captured by the Allies. But the Allies, too, had paid a tremendous price. During the first 30 days of the operation in and beyond Anzio, the combat casualties of the 6th Corps amounted to 17% of its effective strength. British combat losses were relatively heavier than American in terms of the number of troops engaged. The British units lost 27% of their effective strength during the same period. In four months, about 33,000 casualties were evacuated by sea from Anzio, including 24,000 Americans, without the loss of a single patient's life as a result of the process of moving men from shore hospitals to the waiting ships. But there were nearly 5,000 other Allied troops who were not evacuated. <laughs> Arriving in London in the early weeks of 1944, General Eisenhower conferred with his staff officers on the highly complex preparations for Operation Overlord, the long-awaited invasion across the Channel. Now began again the task of preparing for an invasion. But by comparison with the similar job of a year and a half earlier, order had replaced disorder, and certainty and confidence had replaced fear and doubt. From the United States came hundreds of thousands of freshly trained GIs swelling to gigantic proportions the force which was to participate in the greatest invasion in history. The nucleus for this invasion force was formed by the battle-tested veterans of the campaigns in North Africa, Sicily, and Italy during the grim year and a half just past. From puny beginnings, the U.S. Army was now grown into one mighty offensive weapon with one objective. As Supreme Commander of Allied Expeditionary Forces, General Dwight Eisenhower had under his command the top military men in both Great Britain and the United States to assist him in working out the enormously complex plans for the long-awaited invasion across the Channel. The directive from the Combined Chiefs of Staff was simple, merely instructing us to land on the coast of France and destroy the German forces. The general plan approved as the outline of the operation we intended to conduct was 
land on the Normandy coast, build up the resources needed for a decisive battle in the Normandy-Brittany region, and break out of the enemy's encircling positions. Pursue on a broad front with two army groups, emphasizing the left to gain necessary ports and reach the boundaries of Germany and threaten the Ruhr. On our right, we would link up with the forces that were to invade France from the south. Complete the destruction of enemy forces west of the Rhine, in the meantime, constantly seeking bridgeheads across the river. Launch the final attack as a double envelopment of the Ruhr, and follow this up by an immediate thrust through Germany, with the specific direction to be determined at the time clean out the remainder of Germany. The heart of Western Germany was the Ruhr. Nowhere else in Europe were their coal deposits equal in quality and so easily workable. For generations, the Ruhr had been mined alternately by Germany and France, as control of the key territory shifted from one country to the other during the succession of Franco-Prussian wars. Each year, millions of tons of coal were mined in the Ruhr and fed into the maw of Germany's heavy war industry. Without the Ruhr's enormous output of coal, the German war machine could not have functioned efficiently. The huge quantities of materiel which had made Hitler's victories in Europe and Africa possible had their origin in the Ruhr. Now, as Hitler's grip on Western Europe was threatened by the Allies, Nazi war machines continued to pour in a steady stream from German factories, whose operation depended largely on the Ruhr. To prepare for the expected invasion, the Nazis began, early in 1944, to strengthen their Atlantic Wall. Its concrete and steel defenses dominated the beaches along the north coast of France. To German high commanders like Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, the Desert Fox of North Africa, the Atlantic Wall seemed solid enough to withstand any Allied assault. The Nazi heavy coastal guns and the fortifications themselves were heavily camouflaged in an effort to fool any Allied inspection from the sea or air. On shore, the Nazis felt they were invincible. At sea, in the waters off the French coast, the Germans planted a profusion of mines to block the advance of Allied warships and transports. Quelling the potential striking force of Allied fighting men there to almost three million. The strength of the Allied air forces in the British Isles had grown from a few thousand planes in early 1942 to more than 15,000 planes of all types. The 5,000 Allied bombers in England were prepared to drop hundreds of thousands of tons of bombs in support of the invasion. The stockpile of vehicles alone for use in the invasion totaled hundreds of thousands of tons. Every available foot of space on overcrowded Britain was used for storage. Landing craft of all types were in readiness for the assault on the beaches. We undertook a project so unique as to be classed by many scoffers as fantastic. It was a plan to construct artificial harbors on the coast of Normandy. This mulberry unit was practically a complete harbor. the British Isles, experiments were being conducted with devices only recently developed for combating the German war machine. The British set about the task of designing equipment that would facilitate destruction of German obstacles. They used the area at a secluded spot in eastern England for actual test of the equipment so developed. Heavy rollers for destroying mines were among the many items constantly under test. <laughs> 
senior commanders used every possible moment in visiting and inspecting troops. These visits, sandwiched between a seemingly endless series of conferences and staff meetings, were necessary and highly valuable. The men who were to make the greatest assault in history trained exhaustively under conditions similar to those they would probably meet on the continent. The pre-invasion exercises were much tougher than the maneuvers they had known in the U.S., and the men took them much more seriously. The troops gained needed experience in coordinating their simulated attack with that of other units and operating as a well-integrated fighting force. Weapons like the bazooka, used for the first time in World War II, were carefully tested. And the men themselves were toughened up for the invasion in extensive sessions of hand-to-hand -hand fighting. All our preparations were inspected in detail by the highest Allied officials. In all our conferences, Mr. Churchill clearly and concretely explained his attitude toward and his hopes for Overlord. He gradually became more optimistic than he had earlier been, but he still refused to let his expectations completely conquer his doubts. The paratroopers had been trained to peak condition. Both mentally and physically, they were fit and ready to lead the assault on the enemy in France. Prime Minister Churchill and General Eisenhower were impressed with the performance of the paratroopers. The airborne force to be used in the invasion was the greatest up to that time. More than 13,000 men were to participate in the drop behind the enemy's lines. The air plan, already in execution, called for the progressive wearing down of the Luftwaffe and the destruction of critical points in the rail and highway systems so as to isolate the coastal areas selected for assault. The heavy air blows against the railroads in France began in April, about two months before the tentative invasion date. Bombing attacks against French rail centers were the first step in the disruption of the Nazis' communication system in France. Of course, our bombers did not always escape unscathed. realized that these military objectives in France must be intensively bombed, in spite of the considerable risks to our own air crews and planes. <laughs> 
combination of moon, tide, and time of sunrise that we considered practicable for the attack occurred on June 5th, 6th, and 7th. If none of the three days should prove satisfactory from the standpoint of weather, consequences would ensue that were almost terrifying to contemplate. The good weather period available for major campaigning would become still shorter and the enemy's defenses would become still stronger. It was a tense period, made even worse by the fact that the one thing that could give us this disastrous setback was entirely outside our control. I was particularly pleased to secure the services of Admiral Sir Bertram Ramsey as the Naval Commander-in-Chief. He was a most competent commander of courage, resourcefulness, and tremendous energy. Moreover, all of us knew him to be helpful and companionable, even though we sometimes laughed among ourselves at the care with which he guarded, in British tradition and practice, the senior service position of the British Navy. During the weeks before D-Day, General Eisenhower devoted as much of his time as possible to visiting the troops who were to participate in the attack on the Nazis' fortress of Europe. At times, I received advice from friends urging me to give up or curtail visits to troops. They correctly stated that so far as the mass of men was concerned, I could never speak personally to more than a tiny percentage. They argued, therefore, that I was merely wearing myself out without accomplishing anything significant so far as the whole army was concerned. For use in infantry fighting, I would talk about anything so long as I could get the soldier to talk to me in return. All southern England was one vast military camp, crowded with soldiers awaiting final word to go. The whole area was cut off from the rest of England. The government had established a deadline across which no unauthorized person was allowed to go in either direction. Every separate encampment and every unit was carefully charted on our master maps. The men prepared to go aboard ship. Some of the last minute haircuts were a little on the close crop side. Many of the men had fathers who served in France in World War I but never got any farther with the French language than Mademoiselle from Armentiers. Their foresighted sons in World War II were intent on being a little better equipped for those leaves in Paris. Within a week, the troops would be storming the invasion beaches in the greatest military attack in all history. But with final preparations completed, there was time for a few days of relaxation. Finally, during the last days of May 1944, the all-important materiel was moved to the ships. The men were to assemble by the numbers of their ships, and all light vehicles and equipment which were to accompany the assault forces and their ships was to be identified in the same manner to avoid any possibility of a mix-up. On June 1st and 2nd, the troops left their camps and headed directly for the ports of embarkation under the strict surveillance of the military police. The scheduled movement of each unit had been so worked out that it would reach the embarkation point at the exact time the vessels would be ready to receive it. As the time came for shifting our concentrations toward the ports, the southern portion of England became one vast camp, dump, and airfield. At our request, the British government stopped all traffic between this part of England and the remainder of the United Kingdom war-weary British public responded without a whimper to these added inconveniences and privations. The mighty host was tense as a coiled spring, and indeed that is exactly what it was, a great human spring, coiled for the moment when its energy should be released, and it would vault the English Channel in the greatest amphibious assault ever attempted. With D-Day set for June 5th, the weather turned suddenly bad the day before the scheduled assault. Weighing all factors, I decided that the attack would have to be postponed. This decision necessitated the immediate dispatch of orders to the vessels and troops already at sea. However, as the weather cleared, the decision was made to go ahead with the attack on June 6th. 
Again, I had to endure the interminable wait that always intervenes between the final decision of the high command and the earliest possible determination of success or failure in such ventures. I spent the time visiting troops that would participate in the assault. A late evening trip on June 5th took me to the camp of the U.S. 101st Airborne Division, one of the units whose participation had been so severely questioned by the air commander. I talked to them about anything and everything. If men can naturally and without restraint talk to their officers, the products of their resourcefulness become available to all. Moreover, out of the habit grows mutual confidence, a feeling of partnership that is the essence of esprit de corps. An army fearful of its officers is never as good as one that trusts and confides in its leaders.